My name is Ben Twining, and I'm a senior research scientist and the vice president for education here at Bigelow. And it's my great pleasure to be the MC for the evening. Uh, so, as hopefully all of you know, uh, Bigelow Laboratory, well, we probably don't all know, Bigelow Laboratory was uh, founded in 1974, and we moved over to these beautiful digs about a decade ago, and we're really pleased to welcome you all here tonight to learn, um, learn about some really important science from our, from our president, Debbie Bronk. So I want to thank, thank the many supporters in the audience, Bigelow uh, couldn't exist without the folks who support us and give generously uh, science. Much of our funding comes from the federal government, but that doesn't pay all the bills, and we are really grateful for the, for the philanthropic support that we get. So thank you all for that. So I also want to thank... That's going to work? Oh, so I guess I'm, I'm going to do this in my order. I also want to thank H.M. Payson. H.M. Payson is a Maine-based financial institution which has been supporting this series for a number of years, and we're really grateful for that support. So thanks to them. Okay, I'm now going to introduce our speaker tonight. So Dr. Debbie Bonk, I'm very proud to say, is the leader of our institution and also my boss. And we are very lucky <laughs> to have her here tonight. So I was thinking of what I'd say about Debbie, and so I looked at her CV. It's 56 pages long, so I didn't print out all of it uh, for that. Um, but before coming here in 2018, uh, Debbie was a, a professor at the Virginia Institute of Marine Sciences for many years. She is one of the world's leading experts in nitrogen, which is an extremely important nutrient in the ocean. She also served as the uh, Director of Ocean Sciences at the National Science Foundation for a number of years. She's been the president for the Association for the Sciences of Limnology and Oceanography, which is probably the world's leading oceanographic uh, professional society. And she holds a number of other leadership positions nationally, um, actually a huge number of them right now. So she is a, truly a leader in, uh, na nationally and internationally in the field of oceanography. And um, we're very lucky to have her here at Bigelow. So I think with no further ado, I'm going to pass it off to you, Debbie. And before that, I will say there's going to be, are you going to say the format? Who are we yeah, yeah, I got that. Okay, so she'll say the format and uh, Debbie, take it away. Thank you so much. Ben. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, is the is the volume okay? I'm getting a thumbs up. Don't no, no, breathe too heavily. So, um, before we get started into my oops, I'm going the wrong way. Before we get started into my talk, uh, Bigelow lost uh, a, an incredible supporter and somebody very important to this laboratory this year um, when Spencer Apollonio died. And um, here to give a tribute to him. Um, is Patty Matry, Dr. Patty Matry, who knew him well, and, um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Patty for just a minute. Hello, everyone. So just as Ben said, Bigelow Laboratory has existed because of community involvement, oh, community involvement in support, and Spencer Apollonio was a fundamental piece in the starting of the laboratory in 1974. Uh, and at that time, the Yenches, the co-founders of Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences were looking for a new home. And Spencer Apollonio knew of some property um, available in the coastal uh, Maine. Here we have photos of Spencer in the 1950s and then Spencer just a um, couple weeks uh, before he passed. Um, and so I will have to point. The top image is where we were in West Booth Bay Harbor. Even though it says 1974, this photo is actually of the late 80s, early 90s. And some of these Bigelow, uh, buildings where Bigelow digs uh, then and Spencer was involved in securing that those properties from the then governor of the state of Maine, um, then continue as being in the Bigelow board and the Bigelow advisory board was a board emeritus professor. And then until we came to our new house, which is what Ben was describing. And I knew Spencer such as that. 
But somewhere in the 2000s, Spencer showed up in my office with a box full of papers and data and said, Patty, this is Arctic data. Do you want, do you want it? And I looked at it. These were some of the first measurements of prime production in Arctic coastal waters. They now form the basis of the time series for prime production in the entire Arctic data available to everyone in the research community. So I challenged him. I said, if you write the paper, because these data are too good to just stay in a box, I will get the figures in a modern format. And so we did. I hear just list, he had 12 publications from 2010 to just a couple of weeks before he passed, covering things in the Arctic like you have here. Another one of his favorite topics, which was fisheries, especially based in the Gulf of Maine. He was the, uh, the commissioner of the Department of Marine Resources when Bigelow uh, arrived here. That's what it was. Two, the most recent one, which is one at the bottom, uh, on some lake data, and this one has a little good story and then I will end. There, we have a research scientist here, an early career, um, Alex Michaud. And Alex reached out to me because he said, I read this paper from way back when, and then you have a paper with this person and their address is Booth Bay Harbor. Do you know them? And I said, of course. And so I introduced Alex in his early 30s to Spencer in his mid to late 80s. And of course, what did Spencer do? Show up with a box full of data, a lake data, which led to this publication, which came out two days after the untimely and unexpected passing of Spencer. So with that, I would like to honor his curiosity, uh, his persistence. May I have those at that when I am in my mid eighties too, as well as his mentorship of me and other younger scientists. And with that, I'll leave you with that and thank you very much. Thank you, Patty. So when I, my, what, the first event we had, I met Spencer um, and he wanted to know exactly what my plans for and how I was gonna address a number of the issues that the lab was having. So he was, he kept up on what the lab was doing um, the entire time and um, very, very sad of his passing. Okay, so now let's get into the talk. And um, for, if you have any questions as I'm going through, there's gonna be two times um, during the talk that you're going to be able to ask questions uh, midway through and then at the very end. So we'll pass around a microphone um, when the time comes to ask them. Anybody that is online, um, there is a uh, question and answer button at the bottom and you can type in your questions and we've got somebody here monitoring. I think Fritz is monitoring them. Okay, so our topic today is climate change. And during the course of this presentation, I'm going to try to um, answer three questions. The first one is where do things stand today? I think this is the second time I've given a cafe side talk on climate change. The first one was three years ago. Second question is what is Bigelow doing about it? And the third question is what can you do about it? So just to get us all oriented, let's start with the basics. So Earth has a greenhouse effect, right? It is the, the greenhouse effect is the atmospheric blanket of gases that retains some of the incoming solar radiation that comes in, hits the planet and is reflected back. And some of that is retained. We did just like the glass of a greenhouse, retained some of the heat on a sunny day. Humanity did not cause the greenhouse effect. This would be a cold dead rock if there wasn't a greenhouse effect. So we're very fortunate that it's been here. Now the issue comes in with some of the activities that we're doing. So we are taking carbon that's been buried for millions of years in the ground as coal or various petroleum um, types of petroleum products. And we're burning them to power this incredible uh, society that we have, right? So it's, it's done wonders for humanity. But one of the unintended consequences is it's thickening that blanket. 
So in 2021, 36 billion tons of carbon was burned again to power our society and it ended up in the atmosphere, thickening that blanket, holding in more of the solar radiation that is coming in and warming up the planet. Now, this is a graph that is showing, let's see if my pointer is working, yes it is. So this is a graph that is, that is showing the, the impact on surface temperature. So if you, and this is showing a temperature anomaly. So if you take the average global temperatures um, from 1951 to 1980, and then you compare before that period and after that period, you see that before that period, most of the temperatures were cooler. It was, it was, the temperature anomaly was negative. If you go more recently, it's positive. And not only is it positive, it's going up and up and up and up and up every year. And that again is, is simply a fact of this thickening of the blanket. So there's really nothing controversial about this happening. It would be shocking if the temperature wasn't going up considering what's happening with our atmosphere. Now, one question that I get from a lot of people when I give talks like this is, but the climate has always changed. And that is absolutely true. The climate has always changed ever since the planet formed. What is different right now is the speed that it's changing. So this is showing global CO2 atmospheric concentrations going back about 2000 years. This down here in the back, we're at 280 parts per million. And that's kind of where it hovered until really the start of the industrial revolution or actually when the industrial revolution started kicking up. And now, and in the last, especially 30 years, it is just going up, 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 up. And it was 400, nearly 421 parts per million um, in July 1st, 2022. Okay, so we've gone from 280 to 420 in about 100 years. It's, it's an unbelievable amount of, of, of change in our atmosphere and is unprecedented in the geologic record. So we are really, we're talking about uncertain times in terms of what is actually going to happen. So one of the things I do, which is why I have to really focus on being perky, is I read climate change information, terrestrial and ocean, all the time. I really work very hard to try to stay up on um, the latest changes in what's out. And one of the, I also try to keep up on, you know, what are the global, what's happening globally? And so I'm a big fan of The Economist because it's a really comprehensive journal and they also have some great graphics. And this is one of those graphics that stopped me cold and that, you know, you wake up at three o'clock in the morning and you have your free floating fret. And this was one of the, the, the graphics that sticks in my mind. This came out in the spring of 2020. And what it shows is the projected change in the suitability for human habitation in 2070. Okay, so in t let's first talk about 2070. If you've got a 10 year old son, daughter, granddaughter, great grandson, they will be my age, I'm 58. They will be 58 in 2070. So this isn't something in the far distant future. This is something that will be, a, and that is a very appropriate, <laughs> Ring, thank you, because it is creepy. I had a dear friend, and that was the ringtone for their ex-wife. And it, every time I hear it, I, it cracks me, it cracks me up. Okay, so this is this is this isn't going to just 2070. It drops out of the, you know, and it appears. This is something that that we will have to continue dealing with, and that they will spend the prime of their life, which I'm still in, dealing with. And so it's, it's real and it's happening now. So what exactly is this showing? The, the blue or grayish areas are areas, okay. okay, the blue or grayish areas are where there, there really will be no change in, in terms of suitability for humans to live there. When you get to the, well, it's kind of all one color on this screen, but uh, gray or, 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 or um, sorry, salmon or orange or all the way to the red, when you get all the way to the red, that, is area, that are areas that because of either temperature, humidity, or precipitation, meaning ability to grow crops, are areas where you will not be able to have human habitation. And what this really drives home, I think, is the geopolitical challenges that are gonna come into play with the, challenge, with the changes we're seeing on our planet. We think we have a problem at our southern border right now. What happens when vast areas of Central America and the top half of South America is no longer able to sustain human habitation outside of an air-conditioned room? 
the implications are horrifying. And it's already here. So this is at the top of this, which you probably can't see in the back, is the heat index forecast for Tuesday. So that's today. All the, the orange area is danger zone. So that's 103 to 140 degrees. 103 to 124 degrees. These are areas in this country today that you should not be working for any extended period out, um, outside of air conditioning or, or overexerting yourself. Another thing that is very, um, I think especially um, hard to deal with is we are in a very affluent country. We are a country that we love our air conditioning, right? And a lot of us have it, even in Maine, a lot of us have it. But there are people, vulnerable people that don't have it. So hundreds of homeless have already died in extreme heat across the United States. Oh, and I also, so and over a thousand people have died so far in the current heat wave that Europe is, ex, uh, is experiencing in Spain and Portugal. And that's probably a gross underestimate of really the, the fatalities that they're gonna find once this whole thing plays out. It was over 108 degrees in France. You don't think of France as a, as a place that's very hot. So if we are having these kind of fatalities now in affluent countries, you know, what are we doing to the parts of the world where they don't have those kind of resources? Okay, so what is all this warming doing in terms and where is it going, right? All this energy that the planet is retaining, most of it is going in the ocean. Okay, so over 90% of the warming that has happened on the planet, the energy is flowing into the ocean. And there are five things, and these are the same five things that I talked about three years ago, and I go talk with everybody because I really want people to understand the basics of climate change in the ocean. Only this time, I'm going to try to focus much more on the Gulf of Maine. So the first thing is that ocean warming leads to the melting of sea ice. And this is something that is impacting the Gulf of Maine directly right now because it is influencing the main currents that dictate the temperature in the Gulf of Maine. So that is the Labrador current, which comes down and is a cold water current coming from the Arctic. And then the warm Gulf Stream that comes up from the equatorial regions up along the east coast of the U.S., and because of the changes we're seeing in the Arctic, the warming of the Arctic, which is warming much faster than a lot of places, the balance between those currents are changing. And as a result, the Gulf of Maine is changing faster than 99% of, of, the, of the ocean. So this is, again, a temperature anomaly. So here, looking at the average from 1985 to 2012, the red region when you get all the way to the, to the deep red is higher than, um, is greater than an anomaly of five degrees warmer. So this is water, surface water in the Gulf that's more than five degrees warmer on average, which means there will be some times when it's um, warmer and sometimes that it's colder. And you may think five degrees, that's not much of anything, but five degrees for an entire ecosystem, that's, that's enormous. So think about, if you think of us as an ecosystem, our bodies, our temperature should be, 98.6, so call it 99, a five degree increase in our temperature, that's a, that's a fever of 104. You have a baby with 104 degree temperature, you are flying to an emergency room. So these changes may not seem dramatic, but they are dramatic when they happen on, that, on the scale that we are seeing them, just like they would be dramatic if they, if they happened in our own bodies. The second um, thing is that ocean warming is leading to sea level rise and coastal flooding. So about a third of the sea level rise that we've seen so far, which is about seven to eight inches since 1900, is coming from something called thermal expansion. When water is cold, it's denser, right? The water molecules are just more tightly packed. If you warm it up, those water molecules spread out a little bit and it takes up more room. Now these are very small changes and yet, when you look at the volume of the ocean, they, it can have an enormous impact. So about a third of the warming, or sorry, a third of the sea level rise we've seen is from that alone. And we're already seeing it in places in Maine. So this is a shot from March of 2018 in Portland, places that used to flood or, you know, might have flooded when grandmother was alive or, you know, every 10 years it's flood, it's flooded. These are coming back more and more often. And there's a way that we can each look at where we live in the, the potential for flooding um, that is funded through NOAA, through the federal government, your tax dollars at work, the coastal flood exposure mapper. If you just Google NOAA and flood, you'll see it. And I Googled 
East Booth Bay. So you can do this for, for any, your exact address. And so here, just to orient you, especially in the back, so this is East Booth Bay to the left. Here is Bigelow. This is, this down here would be Ocean Point. And the areas over here on the right are showing the, the hazard level. So the darker red it gets, the greater the hazard that you would see with flooding. And fortunately for us, Bigelow, there's nothing red underneath that giant blue star. We're pretty high. The problem is we won't be able to get to it <laughs> once, once things uh, get much worse. Now this isn't projected. This is what's happening right now in terms of the flood risk that we have. And one issue that we're gonna run into, especially in a state like Maine, but it'll be nationwide, is the, the need to replace um, infrastructure, right? So this little bridge that we've got in East Booth Bay isn't gonna hack it for much longer. So how much is that gonna cost? I live on Barter's Island, spent millions of dollars in a year and a half to replace the little bridge that we have. We're gonna be doing this all around the country. And this is again gonna cause the, the resources we're gonna be putting into this. This is an article I read in Forbes earlier this year. Floods will cost US businesses $49 billion this year. So that was, that was last year, this is this year. That's the estimate coming out. To put that in perspective, which I personally find very depressing, NSF's budget this year was, was just under 9 billion. So the resources that we have, are gonna have to put in to address the climate issues that we're facing are, are massive compared to the kind of resources we're putting into really understanding how we need to manage them. So third is ocean warming leads to changes in the migration and distribution of marine organisms. And the big player in Maine is lobsters. So this is showing a graph from 1980 all the way to 2000. Um, and on the left is millions of pounds of lobsters. The blue are lobsters that were landed in New York and the pink are lobsters that were landed in Connecticut. What you can see is it was going up and up and up until the mid nineties and then it crashed. And there really isn't much of a lobster industry at all now in New York. Maine benefited from some of this. As these, the, the, what we believe is happening is as the thermal tolerance of lobsters, just like human beings with that graph from The Economist, lobsters have a thermal range where they want to be. And if you exceed that, they're going to try to find um, go to a place where it is better for them. And right, right now, the warming that's happening, they are marching north. So this is showing going all the way back to 1950 to 2020. And the gray bars are pounds of lobsters, of lobster landing, landed in millions. Um, and it goes up to 140 million pounds. So you can see we're looking really good, but we're starting this decline. And one big question, is that a decline that's gonna follow the trend to, to New York? If past is prologue, it's likely that they're gonna continue marching, marching north as the temperature warms. The fourth thing is ocean warming leads to reductions in ocean oxygen. So on the most fundamental level, water can hold more gas when it's cold. And when it warms up, it can hold less gas, you know, have a, have a cold can of soda and a warm can of soda. When you open it up, one is going to blow up because the gas has, has come out of solution. So this luckily in Maine, this is not a huge problem for us right now because we don't have a, a lot of uh, a high population. Um, so all around these little red dots that are showing up all around the continents, these are hypoxic areas where the oxygen has already been drawn down. What's happening is as, as nutrients come off the land because we have fertilizer, we have septic treatment plant or septic systems, sewage treatment plants, we're putting nutrients into the ocean. Those nutrients are taken up by phytoplankton. And then when they die, the bacteria take over and the bacteria are consuming the oxygen and using it up. In Maine, we've got about what, 1.3 million people. So we haven't run into the same low oxygen problems that a lot of, that I used to study in the Gulf of Mexico or Chesapeake Bay. Um, but it's something we need to keep our, our eye on, especially as we develop aquaculture, where we bring in concentrated area, uh, concentrated um, farms where we're raising a lot of organisms because then oxygen becomes very important and we can start generating problems if we don't do it correctly. And then the last of the five, our increased atmospheric CO2 makes ocean more acidic. 
So basically, if you've got a lot of um, CO2 being added to the atmosphere, everything wants to be in equilibrium. So that CO2 in the atmosphere, some of it will dissolve in the ocean, so it's in equilibrium. And when that carbon dioxide goes into the ocean, it combines with water, H2O, and it forms carbonic acid. And it's that chemical process that results in the ocean becoming slightly more acidic. And the problem with that is if you like seafood or if you are something that uh, has a shell, because the chemistry of that carbonic acid being present and lowering the pH is gonna make it harder and harder for these organisms to, to build their shells. So that's the first half of the talk. And I thought I'd break for questions and um, see if anybody had any questions for me. Any questions for Debbie? Yeah, yeah I'll bring the microphone over to you. It's uh, a problem I'm working on, but in Northern Egypt, a populated area, and I, I'm not a specialist on populations by any means, but I'm wondering among the many societies that you belong to or meetings that you go to, how many raise the issue of what the world as a whole must uh, face in the sense of redu reducing, maintaining, at least maintaining, but not increasing population growth. It's not a minor problem as you would. No, it's, it's, not, it's not at all a minor problem. Well, so the, the societies that I've been a part of, they're oceanographic societies, so we don't really get into population. But one thing that, that we know is if you want to decrease population, the best thing you can do is educate women. Educate women. If the, the more educated a mother is, the, the more you empower her to control her own uh, reproductive destiny, they will choose to have fewer children if they are able. They will be better capable of, of caring for the children that they do have. So you want to do one thing. And this is I'm not saying this as an oceanographer. I have no expert on population dynamics, but I've done enough reading. You want to decrease population, which we desperately have to do. Educate women. Empower women because that has been shown to be effective. Here, here. Other questions? Yeah. And that works better. The emphasis on global warming is on the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but nobody approaches the heat problem. We're producing more and more heat and the hotter it gets, the more the air conditions run, more power it needs to take them. Buildings that we build, you take five acres of land in the summertime, walk across in the grass barefoot, no problem. They put them in these 20-story condos made of cement, which absorb a tremendous amount of heat energy during the day. And at night, the outside temperature may be 60 and you're running your air conditioning that heat's coming into your building. So we're producing a tremendous amount of heat and it seems that nobody approaches the heat end of the, of the problem. You know where the organizations that are really working on an issue that issue, many of them are addressing social justice issues, because if you want to, if you look at these heat islands and urban areas or suburban areas, even um, it is usually poor neighborhoods that don't have trees that don't have the capacity to, to do, you know, just painting roofs white can can go a long way to decreasing um, the albedo, which is the amount of energy that it's going to um, it's going to. Uh, absorb. And in places like Los Angeles, this is, a, this is enormous. You can have a 20 degree difference between a nice uh, tree lined suburb and inner city uh, neighborhood where it's just concrete and asphalt. So you're right. It's a, it's a huge problem. And in this country, it's a huge social justice problem um, because it's really impacting, um, it's really impacting poor neighborhoods. And you see that in the fatality, heat, heat fatalities. Um, are much more uh, prevalent in, in um, poor neighborhoods. Some of it is because they don't have air conditioning, but some of it is just because they are hotter and in some, in some cases, a lot hotter. So yeah, that's an excellent point. Oh, yeah. Here. Oh, sure. 
Um, do you hear any um, things during your meetings with other societies about um, rewriting the laws of people who are extracting carbon fuels? I'm going to get to that at the end. Thank you. <laughs> Question. Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and get. This is a very. This is kind of a downer talk. Everybody's very somber here, and I and I know, but hopefully we'll 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 turn it around a little bit. Um, because we shall never come back. They're depressed for a week afterwards. So, okay. So hopefully this will be more lifty, uplifting. So what is Bigelow doing about it? So when it comes to um, what Bigelow is doing about it, it really falls into three categories, discoveries, inspiration, and solutions. So, and I'm going to start with the discoveries. So as I said, we are, we are first and foremost, a basic research laboratory or a research laboratory. Like we exist to discover things, to answer questions, to produce the data that we need to solve problems, to come up with new theories and new approaches. So that's why we're here. Now, the first part of our mission statement is we study the foundation of global ocean health. And there's enough familiar faces in that you've probably seen me say that like 19 times. So today I wanted to dive a little deeper on what does that actually mean? And the foundation of global health ocean health is really the microbes. So this is, this is a little cartoon that is showing what we call the microbial loop, and it's a magnifying glass. There is, it's a cartoon. Magnifying glasses cannot show viruses or, or bacteria, um, but they might help with some phytoplankton. Anyway, so this is a cartoon of the surface ocean. So you've got phytoplankton, and they are the primary producers. Patty was mentioning primary producers. They are the organisms plants and terrestrial systems, phytoplankton in, in the surface ocean. They take the energy from the sun, carbon dioxide dissolved in the water, and the nutrients, and that's what they use to grow. And they are really the foundation of the ocean food web um, and uh, critically important to understand. But then they exist with bacteria and they're kind of, there's kind of this competition going on all the time between phytoplankton and bacteria, just like Bacteria are trying to, we've got good guys and bad guys. It's the same thing's going on in the ocean. And these two different groups are fundamentally different in terms of carbon. So phytoplankton take up carbon dioxide and they produce oxygen. So they do things that humanity, that's a good thing. Bacteria do the opposite. They're like us. They take up oxygen and they produce carbon dioxide. So understanding the balance of these processes of phytoplankton bacterial processes in the ocean is one of the things we really have to get right if we're going to understand the ocean's role in absorbing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Then you've got viruses. So viruses infect both phytoplankton and bacteria, and they are really important at shaping the kinds of phytoplankton that might be in the ocean, the, the how... Uh, 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 populations of bacteria may change over time. They uh, help with the exchange of genetic information back and forth between different types of, of bacteria. Um, so there, they are this um, really critical role that I think in many respects, um, oceanography is really starting to, to just grapple with. And so this is one huge focus of, of Bigelow. But then we also deal with corals and kelp. Okay, corals and kelp are those primary producers, the foundation of the ocean food webs in the regions where they exist, right? Kelp or the, the um, symbiotic algae that live in corals take up carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. And then we go one layer up, okay? Then we also deal with things like microzooplankton and zooplankton, although I really should have put an X through the fish because we really don't do fish. So we go one level up in the things that are eating these other microbes or the kelp or the corals. And that's, that's our box. That's, and that focus in maintaining um, that relatively tight focus is one of the reasons we've had been able to be so impactful. So, I, so we're one of the top labs in the entire world working in this space. And I wanted to just talk a little bit about just the kind of firepower we've got here, which I think is, gives me a lot of hope that we're gonna solve issues. So I'm gonna go through, and I'm not gonna talk about all the scientists here, but I'm gonna go through a number of them to show who we've got working on various aspects of, of this problem, because this, the issue of these microbes really is critical to climate change and understanding how to, how to deal with it. So we've got Steve Archer. Steve Archer deals with, with gas exchange. He studies, um, the, the gases like CO2, methane, sulfur gases, the microbes that produce it, how it's exchanged with the atmosphere. 
We've got people like Barney Bulch, who has studied phytoplankton, that giant coccolithophore you walked by when you came in. Barney studies those guys. Very important to carbon transfer in the ocean and how much carbon phytoplankton take up and can bury and remove from the system. And he uses satellites as a tool for, um, for studying phytoplankton over broad areas. Then we have Kath Mitchell, who is a physicist from Scotland. She's one of our recent hires, and she's trying to expand the use of satellites to really study um, the ocean and these systems. Then we've got a whole slew of people that are studying phytoplankton. And, and when I say phytoplankton, all of these people, you, you cannot exist at Bigelow if you, are, if you do just one thing. You got to be scrappy. You got to be the jack of all trades. So I'm kind of narrowly um, summarizing what they do, but they all do many different things. So we've got um, Mike Lomas, Leanne Whitney, um, um, oh my God, Pete Countway. I'm gonna tell you one of my phobias is introducing people. Pete is in the in the office next door to me. I've known him for 30 years. So please don't tell him I forgot his name. So we have one of our newest scientists, um, Manoj Kamalanathan, um, Nicole Poulton, Rachel Sippler. They all deal with very aspect, various aspects of phytoplankton, um, how, phyto, how their growth is controlled, nutrients and how nutrients control it, um, what the harmful types of phytoplankton that are out there, a broad array of, of studies looking at phytoplankton. Then we have the, the viruses. So um, uh, uh, Joaquin Martinez, Martinez, expert on viruses. Our newest research scientist is Julia Brown. Um, I, again, she's a bioinformatician specializing in viruses and, and a spectacular young researcher that's really shedding a lot of light on how these systems work. And then we've got some people that are, that are focused a little more on, on bacteria. So we've got Dave Emerson and Alex Michaud, who are, they do a lot of work in the Arctic. Um, they focus um, on iron, which is what I just realized, Ben, you're not on here. Oh, my God. You were so high on the list because he's a vice president. I didn't look at his. Oh, well, he won't mind. People don't mind being ignored. Um, so <laughs> Ben is also an iron person that should have that should have been up here. Oh, God. OK, we're just going to keep going. Um, and then we've got the people that 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 study the the higher levels that are eating all these microbes. Karen Stamieskin is one of our newest hires. And then the effervescent David Fields, if you haven't heard him give a talk, you, you're, you're missing something. He's fabulous. And then we've got the people like Nicole Price and Doug Brasher that are studying corals and kelps and 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 how they contribute to, to carbon in, in a system. And then you've got. Um, somebody like Nick Record, who's an oceanographer, mathematician, and he is a modeler. So he's trying to tie together lots of these different data streams, both to create understanding for the scientists, but also tools that the scientists can use, but also the general public can use. And one point I want to make is I'm showing you lots of faces, but each one of those people has their own lab group. So this, I'm, as an example, I'm going to show you um, Nick Record's lab group. So this is Nick again. He's a little furrier this time, so it's probably taken during the pandemic. Um, and this is his, this is his uh, lab group. These are uh, interns, graduate students, postdocs, um, research technicians, and, and associates. These are, this is a whole other type of scientist we have here, um, highly skilled with technical expertise that are really the boots on the ground for getting the field work and, and experiments done. And Nick leads this group. Um, in the Tandy Center for Ocean Forecasting. Again, trying to pull together lots of different information into usable forms fast enough so that it's useful for somebody, say, in the aquaculture industry. And I'm skipping over that slide because I meant to take it out. Um, and so that's, that's the discover side. And so these, these are people that are fundamentally advancing how we understand how the ocean works and will respond both uh, uh, during climate change, but also a, a whole variety of other things. So now I'm gonna flip over to the second part of our mission statement. And this is, and we use our discoveries to improve the future for all life on our planet. And we do this primarily in two ways. The first is through inspiration, and the second is through solution-based research. So on the inspiration front, we do um, a number of things. First, we have education programs, wonderful education programs. And while I was putting this together, I was thinking we got to get Ben to do as he's Ben Twining is our vice president of education. And we really need a cafe side talking about the education programs because they're great. Over the last decade or so, we have uh, worked with over 2000 students 
um, from all the way from high school, undergraduate, graduate, postdocs. Um, and one of the, or actually the two things that we are really known for and we really focus on is one, um, experiential learning. So bringing students into the lab, embedding them in research groups, and, and really trying to give them experience of what it is like to be a scientist. And the thing we hope many of the, or all of them walk away with is the second thing, and that is critical thinking skills. Is there anything more important that we all need right now with the rampant misinformation that is out there? Providing skills to these kids when they leave, or adults, many of them are, are they're not all kids, um, that is desperately needed today is to be able to look something on, at, online, look at something in a journal or a, a magazine or a newspaper, and critically think about what's being said and how they might wanna follow up to decide whether what they're reading is true or not. It's a, it's a real, I think, important service for society that, um, that programs like Beagle are trying to instill. We also do a whole slew of workforce development. So we've done this for ocean science, the ocean science community for decades. When I was running my own lab, um, nutrient chemistry lab as a professor, three times I sent people from my lab up to Bigelow to learn new skills, right? So because this is where kind of the state of the art was happening and I wanted to bring back those skills. So we've been doing that for a long time. We would like to expand that to try to do more to help the workforce in the state of Maine. And this is something that it kind of really kind of took a back seat during the pandemic, but it's something that is in our strategic plan and we'd like to pursue. Then we do a whole slew of art collaborations. You saw you walk by Majestic Fragility. That is a, a collaboration with artists. It, it's great. It inspires us so that every day when we come into this building, we hope it also inspires the, the people that come to visit. And any of you that attended the Cafe Sci last week, it was fantastic. Listen, you know, just the, the moving music and art can be so important to try to get people engaged and to care about what's going on. And then finally, community outreach, like Cafe Sci. So I, I hope when I, you leave here today that I have in some way inspired you to take action and to learn more about the, the things that we're talking about. Okay, so now we're going to switch over to solution. Um, so you, you can't study microbes today without thinking about climate change. And uh, because the microbes are existing in this planet that is changing very rapidly. And the, the, the fact that things are changing so rapidly, I think for many scientists have really added an urgency to the work. Just understanding how something is working is really only the first step. So not all scientists here, but, but a number of scientists here are also interested in expanding their research into finding solutions, finding, um, developing processes or products that they can get into the market and get into the market at scale, because that's another way we can have an impact. And we, we, we have an impact in this way um, with primarily through partnerships. So as a world-class research laboratory funded by the taxpayers of America in many respects, I think we have an obligation to be a source of expertise for um, all types of groups and for economic development whenever we can help support that. And we do that in a number of ways and really putting Bigelow kind of at the center or at the nexus of these partnerships is something that I will always work um, to try to do, because I think it's, it's so critically important. You know, I think 30 years ago, there was a lot more competition and I'm kind of a type A person. So I was a very competitive person. And one of the things I've been actively trying to do is squash that the time for competition is past. We are out of time. We got to work together to leverage resources to the maximum we can. And that is through these kind of partnerships. So we work with state programs and agencies. A great example of that is we, if you eat seafood in the state of Maine, you can be assured that that seafood is safe because we partner with the Maine Department of Marine Resources and using state-of-the-art techniques, we measure the biotoxins in the water and in shellfish to make sure that it's safe to eat. We have a whole slew of, um, of partnerships with schools and universities throughout the, throughout the state and actually throughout the country um, and because we are an independent lab, we rely on those partnerships to, to bring us the student and allow us to fund our education programs. We go through, we also work with nonprofits and NGOs. One of my favorite um, is the local Booth Bay Sea and Science Center. I don't know if any of you are aware of that. The Pauline Dion is wonderful. Um, they are using our uh, modular out right um, when you walked into the right. 
That's where they're running their programs out this year. Anything we could possibly do to help Pauline in that group, we will pull out all the stops for. And then we also work with business and industry, either through taking doing contracts, doing contracted research to try to help them, or we operate a whole slew of facilities, the Bigelow Analytical Services, um, the Center for Aquatic Cytometry, Single Cell Genomic Center. We have all these centers that we take samples in, not just internally, but we also um, can serve industry and businesses outside of us. And I wanna give, go through just a few examples of, um, of, of some of the kind of solution-based or more practical um, work that we're doing. One is, this is Christoph Apley. He is currently at the Swiss Federal Institute of Aquatic Science and Technology, um, learning new techniques to analyze and study PFAS. So PFAS are these forever chemicals you've been hearing about in the paper. Um, they are things like fire retardant foam, Gore-Tex, these things were developed for very good reasons. Unfortunately, they are very toxic and they stay around in the, in the environment for a long time. So Christoph is trying to bring more expertise to the state on that front. Uh, we have a variety, uh, a, lot of, uh, a number of the programs and projects we have here support the aquaculture industry. Aquaculture is something that we as a country and humanity in general has to get right. We're never gonna take the pressure off wild stocks if we don't have, um, have robust aquaculture and, and fish farming. So trying to support that, trying to support the development of it being done correctly is something that's very important to us. So this is a shot of, um, of a salmon in a, at a farm. And we've got uh, Maya Groner is a new researcher um, that joined us just this past year. And then David Fields, they study um, sea lice. I had a picture of sea lice, but they, when I did the practice, they said it was disgusting and would put people off. So I removed it. Um, but so, so just helping them deal with this, with this, you know, horrible parasite is, is a service to the aquaculture industry. Then we've got Mike Lomas, who's, um, directs the center for algal innovation. So this is looking at salmon. So wild salmon is uh, the, the pinker salmon in, the more valuable it is. Wild salmon is that deep, wonderful red. And that's because they eat phytoplankton that has the pigment astaxanthin in it. And that astaxanthin is what's turning it pink. Farm salmon is usually a pale gray unless astaxanthin gets added to the feed. Now the cheapest kind of astaxanthin to add to the feed is synthetic astaxanthin that is produced from a petroleum derivative not necessarily what you want to be eating. On the other hand, natural astaxanthin is very expensive. And so it's just cost prohibitive to use in feed. But Mike has been working for a while on this organism hematococcus. This is hematococcus on the, saw, on the left. And when it's um, all happy and healthy, I guess phytoplankton do not have emotions. When it's healthy and have all the nutrients that it needs, it's bright green. And when you stress it, when you, when you stress it in a number of different ways, it turns bright red because it starts producing astaxanthin. And so if you're a, a skilled aquaculturist like, uh, uh, like Mike is, where a uh, great knowledge of phytoplankton, learning how to tweak how you grow these cells to maximize astaxanthin um, is an important service for the industry and something that he's been working on. Then we also are working, trying to support the, the um, kelp industry. So um, kelp farms are very, low tech in general, they you basically need a boat and an understanding of the ocean. So it's a great additional supplemental income for, for fishermen. Um, and so Nicole Poulton and Nicole Price have been working on ways to develop these seed ropes and to cryopreserve and store seed ropes. So in case they're needed after storms. And the beautiful thing about this is that kelp is like a giant sponge for carbon. It can grow up to two feet in a day and when, it take, and when it takes all that carbon out, it basically removes the acidification that's already happened. It's like turning the clock back in regions where um, kelp grows. And then the last, the last one I wanted to talk about in terms of our commercial is Burp Buster. Burp Busters, actually the name started as a joke. It's no joke anymore. So we've raised nearly $27 million to support the development a feed supplement that reduces the production of methane in the guts of cows using algae and macroalgae. And that's important because methane is a potent greenhouse gas it's about, um, depending on, on the assumptions you make, can be up to 84 times the warming potential of carbon dioxide. And cows are a major source of it. 
from, from humanity. And this is one of those projects that you're thinking, well, that's a wild idea. And then they get through one hurdle and they get through another hurdle and they get through another hurdle. And now I think they're actually gonna pull this off, which is very exciting. We just got $14 million last year from USDA to do large scale cow trials. So to the taxpayers in the room, thank you very much for funding those. Not anything I thought I would do as an oceanographer. Um, but if we can get the supplement to market and get it into millions, hundreds of millions of cows, we have the potential to change methane concentrations in the atmosphere. And that is amazing. And I'm putting my money on them. Okay, so uh, just to tie this whole thing up, let's think about what can you do about it? And the first thing, unfortunately, is what you can do is you can realize that science alone isn't enough. And I think this is a, a bitter pill for a lot of us to swallow. I think the idea that we can continue to live as we've always lived and science will come to the rescue, we are just way past the point where that is, can happen. You need to please support science, not just the work at Bigelow, but, but science on climate change in general, because it is desperately needed, but it alone can't do it. You also have to realize that individuals, we as individuals alone aren't enough. And I'll give you one example. So many of us are really committed to recycling, right? So we compost, we recycle, we buy used, we refurbish, doing all these things to try to reduce the amount of waste that we are creating. And yet for every ton of waste produced in residential settings, industry produces 70 tons of waste. So even if everybody across the United States does everything they can to limit their waste, we are, we are gonna be impacting 1 70th of the problem. So this is where it gets a difficult talk for a scientist to take because I avoid politics like the plague if I possibly can. But as a sci scientist who cares about climate change, I don't think I can avoid that conversation anymore because the reality is we have got to have legislative solutions that will control what industry does and help industry, well, force industry to make the decisions that are appropriately to the gentleman's question earlier um, about, um, about industry. So it would be wonderful if we created a, a cultural ethos where industry and businesses considered the environment in their, um, in their dealings and in their bottom line. And many companies now are doing that. They, there's many main companies now that are doing that, which is wonderful. But the reality is we don't have time to develop that kind of ethos. We should, we should support it and push it, but that alone, we just don't have time. So what it comes down to is we need legislation, we need laws that will transform our energy industry, our transportation industry, and we need them soon. And for that, it's gonna take leadership leadership at the national level, leadership that will go beyond to the international level. And it's very depressing right now when you think of the gridlock that we have in this country, but think about what this country has done in the past. I mean, when you think about the history of what the United States was before World War II, we were woefully unprepared to enter a world war, but we pulled it together, we got it done, and what an incredible service to humanity that you know, entering that war was. When Sputnik went up, it was a real shock to our system, but we mobilized, we did something that even the science community at the time didn't think we could do. We put a man on the moon, we can mobilize. There was a time in the 60s, 50s and 60s where rivers in this country were on fire, where uh, you know, breathing in the city of Los Angeles was, was detrimental to your health, but we passed both sides of the political spectrum work together. They passed the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and the change in the health of this country because of those two acts, you really can't overstate. So we've got to go back to that time when we start talking to each other again, and we can start that as individuals. I'm very proud to say that at Bigelow, we've got uh, people on our staff and on our board and advisory board from both sides of the political spectrum and everywhere in between. We don't always agree, but we always have a courteous and respectful conversation when we talk, right? We try, we, we do that 99% of the time. And I would love to see all of us start demanding that from our leaders. So one way you can do that is you can vote. 
But I think at this point in time, voting alone isn't even enough. We've got we've to get involved in the political process. We've got to start demanding that courtesy and respect of the people that are running for office. We need to ask them about climate questions. What's their plan? Do they have people on their team that can address it? And really, how do they feel about the person on the other side of the aisle? Because we need them to work together. So just judging them from the standpoint of, are they treating those people with courtesy and respect? I think for me, goes would go a long way. And that is, I hope I haven't over, overstepped, but as a scientist, we are not gonna get this done if we don't move this into, the, into legislation that demands and is implementing the changes that we need. And now this is my last slide. And I promise that as I did this a couple of years ago that I was always gonna leave people with one concrete thing you can do. A couple of years ago, I said, wash on cold. Just turn your wash machine to cold and wash, you will save energy. And today I wanna leave you with the number of 1.4 billion. And that is the number of plastic bottles of body wash that are produced every year. And I love this stuff. I mean, I really do. It smells great. It's wonderful. It's terrible. Stop giving it to me. People keep giving me these things. You know what is also a great alternative? A bar of soap wrapped in paper. Right? A bar of soap wrapped in paper. For those of you that celebrate Christmas, everybody in my family and their stocking got a bar of soap from a little shop in town. There's so many wonders. They smell great and a little soap dish. I can honestly say it was not the most popular gift, but, but I think it is the most important one I gave. So I want to encourage you to don't buy any more plastic bottles of, of, of gel and buy a bar of soap. And with that, I will stop for questions and thank you very much for your attention. All right, questions for Debbie. We'll go in order of your hand going up here. And Fritz, are you, I see there's a number of chats. Are you, okay. Um, the National Cancer Institute uh, has a listing of molecules that could be interesting. And they make that list available in databases where scientists could explore whether or not medicines can come out of those or effective medicines. Does Bigelow Labs or any similar foundation list the biomolecules isolated from the microbiome, the oceanic microbiome, and is that list available to the public? That's first quick question. <laughs> I don't, I don't know to the extent they're microbes. So um, one of our scientists, Ramuna Stepanaskis, is, is very interested in metabolites and potential uh, biomolecules that bacteria and viruses can, or bacteria and phytoplankton can produce and what you can use them for. To the, so I know all of our scientists upload their data into national repositories. There's genetic repositories that they upload their um, genomic information. I don't know if they're at the level I'm a biogeochemist, so I'm not a very good person to answer that. I'm not sure. I, I, I'm a, a lay drug hunter myself. Um, just a quick second question. I'm really curious. What's the status of growth promoters in the aqua industry today in the United States? So is, say that again. The status of growth promoters, in other words, antibiotics in the water for fish to oh. grow fast. So... Um, What's the status? Well, here's not, it's, there's a lot, I think there's a lot of potential. There's not a lot of movement. So one thing about um, industry and this kind of, of work, the medical field has, has built the pipelines that they need to get an idea for a, a drug, for example, through the pipeline and to clinical trials or to talk to investors. Marine science is way, way behind in that respect. And I think one, one thing that Bigelow is really trying to do is, is fill that gap and work that way. And when I think now, since we brought in all of this money for burp busters, I'll use that as an example, we are using these biomolecules from, um, from algae and macroalgae. We have not, that is not on any website, or if it is, we're in big trouble because we're trying to patent that. Um, but we're trying to use that to, for this supplement. Now, 
Looking back five years ago, how I thought that would evolve was nowhere near what happened. And one of the issues we have in marine science, because we don't have that, that established pipeline to deal with these ideas, we don't have the ways to pay for them. Burke Busters has made such incredible progress because we have a, a, a very savvy donor, Andrew Davis, um, and the Shelby Cullum Davis Charitable Fund, who has funded uh, working with intellectual property lawyers, marketing of, of, we can develop something, but if farmers don't want to use it, it's not going to do anything. So marketing experts, looking at carbon from the beginning of the, of the production of a substance all the way through the transport, are we actually making something that is going to reduce carbon or are we going to spend more carbon doing what we're trying to do? So all of these things, we're just really now building the pipeline to ask those questions and to know the questions to ask. So it's, I think there is incredible potential in microbials. Mike Lomas is very interested in that and has worked with a, a, a few groups. Um, but what we need to do in marine science to take advantage of that is to really learn from biotechnology on how they move things forward. And, um, and that's something that we are actively working on. All right, I've got a comment here and then we're gonna to go to you, Fritz. Hi, I had a quick comment and then a question about the burp busting cow process. So I'm actually from the governor's office here in Maine um, and coordinate the Maine State Climate Council and wanted to thank your staff for being part of the climate council process where we have a state climate plan that's really strongly guided by the best climate science and scientists here in the state of Maine. And it's, tackle, it's really showing great state leadership in tackling these issues. Um, and the plan is called Maine What We Said. Thank you. And I wanted to ask when the first burp busting cows will start coming onto landscape and if some of those will be here in Maine. Mm -hmm. So when are the first burp busting cows? So we are moving into, into cow trials now. One of the challenges, oddly enough, is finding enough cows um, because we need to have we need to have cows in research herds that are are heavily controlled. So we're excluding variables that could impact the results. So we're moving into that now. Um, and I should probably I, I don't know if they have already started those experiments. I do know that the pandemic really was a hit. So we clearly don't have any cows here. So we are partnering with groups. Um, like the Miner Institute, um, Wolf Neck, Neck Farms, which is here in Maine. So when all of that, I would say, I would say aggressively, we're two to three years out from having even a trial supplement, because we, first we got to see, let me back up. I think we, they now know how to do it, right? There's no question, can they do it, right? So now the challenge is, are there any other ramifications of the cows? Any, any things that they haven't considered when you actually put this stuff in a cow? And then looking at all the, the business side, can we make this cheap enough? Um, can we market it effectively? Are there people willing to use it? And so that is, that's I think a little, little ways down the road. Um, but again, with this funding that we've gotten from Andrew Davis, we're tackling that, for example, an FDA consultant, somebody that could look at the design of the experiments and say, which we are designing a scientist, that's a royal we, I don't design that, but designing these experiments, is that sufficient how that is designed in order to pass FDA once we get the data? So that's one example of um, really learning all the hoops we need to jump through and what we have to consider if we're gonna get a viable product. All right, I've got one from online. And this is about ocean mining. How much attention is being paid to the mining of the metal nodules for some of the metals needed for motors, batteries, and other products? And there's a balance on one hand, it may impact the ocean environment, but on the other hand, some are being used to manufacture renewable energy products and other similar uh, in industry uses. Yeah, deep ocean mining is a, is a tough one. So I, um, I actually took out a slide um, that, uh, because Beth Orcutt, who is our new interim vice president for research, um, she is an expert on the deep biosphere. So there's actually more living, um, living biomass, living uh, material under the bottom of the ocean than there is visible above it. So it's this, we think it's cold dead rock. I shouldn't have called it cold dead rock. It's not really, it is teeming with microbes that, that really 
uh, push the envelope of what we think about something being alive. And Beth is just starting this year is leading COBRA. Don't ask me what that stands for. I should know that. But it's a $2 million project from the National Science Foundation leading an international consortium to talk about these issues, right? So, and what we, what we know about um, recovery in the deep ocean when mining is happening, uh, where the gaps in knowledge are. And so that is, we do have somebody that's a real leader nationally in that. Um, and I think she gave a, I think she gave a cafe side talk. Was that just last year or the year before last? So we do have, we do have her team is working on that. And it is a tough question, right? Do you decimate part of the deep ocean? Because at this point, even the places that were mined 30 years ago have shown zero sign of recovery at all, right? So these are very fragile ecosystems. Um, do you destroy something that could, you know, take hundreds of thousands of years to recover? in order to save you know, the surface planet um, because those things like cobalt and lithium are desperately needed for car batteries, storage batteries, um, solar panels. So it's, it's, it's tough, that's a tough one. And another one from online. Um, we have a question about the relationship between sea ice, albedo and temperature. Uh, so less sea ice, does that mean increased temperatures because of the reflective properties? Yes, so if just like if you walk across, um, to somebody mentioned grass, you walk across grass and it's cool. You walk across a black asphalt parking lot and you're gonna burn your feet. That's because the asphalt parking lot is absorbing much more of the heat. It has very low albedo, which is the reflect, I hope I, did I say that right? The albedo, okay, right, so albedo. <laughs> I'm turning to somebody that's recently taught undergrads, which I haven't done for five years. It's amazing how much you know when you teach undergrads. So albedo is the, the reflectance of a surface. So something with very high albedo, like painting a roof white, a lot of the solar radiation that's coming in is gonna go right off it. So when we have um, ice in the Arctic, that ice has high albedo and it's gonna reflect a lot of the energy. When it melts, we've got blue water. And that blue water does not have nearly as high an albedo and much more of the energy gets retained. So it's like this positive feedback loop. Excellent. Thank you, Debbie. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>